know that I went into Oppenheimer very excited. I was so excited, not just because of the Barbenheimer hype. I was like, I'm doing it. I saw them back to back on uh, Monday and then Tuesday. Uh, But also because uh, Universal was letting us see it on a proper IMAX, the IMAX, AMC Lincoln Square, the greatest IMAX in the world. So I was going to see it as Christopher Nolan intended it. And also, I had thought the trailers were very exciting, and I love history. I was like, oh, this is going to be good. So imagine my disappointment when, forget not meeting my expectations, I'd actually say this is not a good movie. All right, headlines. What kind of Nolan fan am I? A lot of you were asking me this yesterday when I tweeted that I didn't like the film. You were like, all right, well, let's see how we line up as Nolanites. Well, like pretty much everyone on the face of the earth, I loved The Dark Knight. Uh, Memento was, of course, very clever and rightfully jump-started Nolan's career. Inception was pretty good. It did make me question reality for a few days, so I have to respect that. And I actually kind of liked Tenet, particularly after the first half when the movie started to make it clear what was actually happening. Uh, Although I did have to watch that movie with subtitles. I understood everything that was said in this movie. Well, I heard what they were saying. If you're not into physics and advanced math, that's another thing that might be a little bit tough about this movie. Like, I not only don't get physics, I'm not interested in getting physics. So So I was like, can we stop talking about physics? Uh, Nolan's other films are, in my opinion, watchable. They're certainly, they're fine, right? But my least favorite by far is Interstellar, which I know some of you love, so maybe you'll like Oppenheimer. But to me, Oppenheimer is Nolan's worst film. Like, no question. I would rather watch Interstellar again than watch this. Although I do plan to see it again, because I do have some friends who want to go. So, but it's gonna, I'm not going uh, this coming weekend. I'm gonna wait a week, and so I, I'm happy about that. Now, and also, I'm very curious to see what other people think about this film. So, should you see it in IMAX? That's another burning question many of you have. Well, even though that's how Nolan intended you see his movie, I actually don't think you need to see it in IMAX. By the way, because he insisted on a, on a print that's projected instead of a digital copy of the film, somebody must have dropped our IMAX print on the ground because it was covered in dirt and hair, particularly in some of the close-up scenes with like just people's faces filling the entire screen. You were like, hmm, look at that hair. I mean, or that speck of dust. And it would change like from shot to shot. And you'd be like, oh, look at that pattern of swirlies over there. It was not good. <laughs> I hope I hope that your print is cleaner than ours was. And we were like one of the first people to see it. It's not like I was seeing this movie weeks later. All right, on that note, the film is, you know, it's a drama instead of like a big science fiction style movie. So it has a lot of really big close-ups. And at my press screening, I sat, I would say, a third of the way down from the top of AMC Lincoln Square. And if you're at all familiar with that theater, as I know some of you are, here's a picture of it, you'll know kind of where I was. And I felt I was way too close. Uh, And I had sat there because, you know, usually I do sit at the back of that IMAX. But for this movie, after I'd seen Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, uh, at at, at this, I'd I'd had to sit a little further down because, you know, it was hard to get seats at that press screening for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And I ended up really liking where I was sitting. I was like, oh, this is cool down here. Uh, But then when I sat here there again for uh, Oppenheimer, I was like, I am way too close to the screen. So no matter what size screen you see Oppenheimer on, I would sit a little further back than you normally do, unless you are someone who always sits at the back of the theater. And then I don't understand you. Why do you want to sit all the way back there? I like to feel like I'm in the movie. But for Oppenheimer, I needed to be a little bit further back. Now, can you do the Barbenheimer double feature? I wouldn't recommend it. I know a lot of you are excited about this, but I don't think it's a good idea. Now, sadly, I know some of you are already locked in. Um, cause you bought your tickets. That's, I mean, I'm so happy to see people celebrating going to the movies and that's fun, but you're locked in cause you bought your tickets very far in advance. So you know what I would do if I were you, you'll know if you like Oppenheimer in the first 15 to 20 minutes, that's what the movie's like. It's not going to get any different. So there's no harm. I mean, check with your theater before you go into your showing, but be like, Hey, if I come out like 15 minutes after this movie starts, Will you exchange my ticket for another day? And there's no shame in that. Don't sit through the full three hours of Oppenheimer if you don't like the first 15 to 20 minutes, right? Because it's going to ruin your Barbie experience, no matter what order you watch the movies in. I think both of them are the kind of movies that you want to think about. I know I see a lot of people being like, you're going to want to think about Oppenheimer. And maybe you are. I thought about, like, where did it go wrong? 
But I think you're going to want to think about Barbie too. Heck, maybe for you, maybe you won't like Barbie. Maybe you'll want to think about where they went wrong. But the movies are so different, but yet make such an impact. I think you want to kind of like savor both of them. So, and I think seeing Oppenheimer after Barbie would totally be a killjoy situation. I mean, I thought about, I'm still thinking about Barbie. I'm glad that I saw the movies on separate days. Okay, so what didn't I like about Oppenheimer? Well, I think my biggest complaint is that the ad campaign was very misleading. This is not a thrilling film. The trailer was so thrilling. Nope, not at all. Uh, and it's more of like a choppy slow burn, right? And, just, and that you would think, isn't that, doesn't that not work? Isn't that, or, or, isn't that the opposite of each other? And exactly, a choppy slow burn does not work. And that's what Nolan made. And despite there being an explosion on the poster, it's on the freaking poster, there was only one atomic explosion in the film itself. And because, I, I couldn't believe it. And because Christopher Nolan didn't want to use any VFX, it's a disappointing atomic explosion. Everything in the ba about the bomb itself is either abstract or muted. They're like, cool light trick, huh, right? Uh, it seems like the bomb is in the room. And I'm like, I can't believe you're not giving me more atomic bomb. Uh, even the terrifying, iconic mushroom cloud is not done right. I'm like, how do you not get that right? It's burned into everyone's brain at this point. And you never truly see the horrors that were unleashed by the creation of the atomic bomb. Um, in a movie about the horrors of the atomic bomb. I think that is a real missed opportunity and for ridiculous reasons. There is nothing wrong with using CGI because obviously you can't set off a real atomic bomb. But you know who did? All these people in real life that this movie is about. And there's tons of actual footage of these very atomic tests of the very one that they're making a movie about. And a lot of it is now declassified. So I don't know why Nolan didn't at least use that. He's like, look at this close-up of fire. And I'm like, I've seen close-ups of fire before. Are you kidding me? Oppenheimer isn't like Nolan's uh, other movies. Instead, it's his take on a scientist biopic. I'm talking, it made, me, it made me think of the theory of everything. That's what I think the closest approximation is, only Nolan style. But also, you know, the imitation game or a beautiful mind. But those are better films. Uh, here, the movie is told out of order, distractingly so, and, you know, the truth of the matter is is that Oppenheimer was a grade-A jerk. Like, wow, an extremely unlikable person who surrounded himself with other unlikable people in his personal life. Now, you can't make Oppenheimer a great guy if he was a jerk. He was a jerk, so you can't change it. But then he shouldn't be the main character of your movie. You have to focus on someone else. And then Oppenheimer, I mean, this is like filmmaking 101. And then Oppenheimer is a character within the film. Then on the flip side, you have Robert Downey Jr., who's the other major character in the film, playing Louis Strauss. Uh, he, he isn't likable either. So really here, you have a bunch of unlikable people doing horrible things. And on that note, I think that the film is a little bit, well, I would say very unfair. The whole premise put forth here is that how could we unleash such horror? That seems to be the commentary. Uh, and we live in a time, by the way, where unthinkable things seem to happen on a daily basis, which makes this movie particularly depressing. But the bottom line is that once mankind discovered that a bomb like this could be made, it wasn't a question of if, but who. Who would have the bomb? And America found itself in a race, not just with the Nazis, but then with Russia. So to vilify these scientists, military leaders, and politicians, I think is unfair. Or to, to, be, to be laudatory of some of their, I think, some of the scientists' unreasonable positions and questions. Although maybe you'll be team scientist. Uh, I was kind of, you know, I, I mean, obviously these were horrible decisions that had to be made, but the point is they had to be made. And I don't think that the movie was presenting that clearly enough. Uh, not having the bomb was not an option. So I don't understand why the movie was even asking that question. I found that frustrating. Although, you know what was nice to see that despite, you know, the way people try to paint the past, we were always this messed up, right? This movie highlights that. We were always divided and in a mess. The only difference now is that we have technology and social media, which makes the world smaller, and now we're all aware of everybody else's problems and differences of opinion, right? <laughs> so, you know, it was just as bad back then. All right, now, back to the actors. Uh, this really is a two-hander, Killian Murphy and Robert Downey Jr. Killian Murphy, to be fair, 
is fantastic uh, and commands the camera and boldly is willing to play an incredibly unlikable man. He goes for it. He's like, heck yeah, Oppenheimer was a jerk. He cuts a razor sharp figure on screen, particularly with Oppenheimer's suit and hat and pipe, which at least makes his character very interesting. I was like, oh, he looks cool. Now, while some have praised Robert Downey Jr.'s performance here, I gotta tell you, I thought he was awful. I was like, wow, I can't believe that these were the takes that they used. How bad were the other ones? He does have glimmers of greatness in his quieter moments here, but overall, I thought he was overacting, trying desperately to erase Tony Stark. But all I saw was an older, depressed Tony Stark who had a sore throat. I was like, are you kidding me with this voice choice? As for the rest of the cast, it's a parade of cameos. Like, every time, a f and, and, and every time that a familiar face popped up, which was like every 10 minutes, it takes you a little out of the film. You're like, oh, hey, look who it is. Oh, I can't believe you're still working. Is your role, is this major actor's role really that small? Oh, they're back again, but not for much. All these famous faces seem to be trying to say that this is, ooh, an important movie. Look at all the people who are in this movie. But I think it's really a cheap trick to make these characters land, even though Nolan hasn't bothered to develop any of them, except for Oppenheimer and Strauss. Again, the two most unlikable people in the movie. Uh, the familiar faces that do manage to make an impression, I thought, were Alden Ehrenreich, Dane DeHaan, and Josh Hartnett, who I just saw in Black Mirror. So I was like, oh, Josh Hartnett's agent's doing a pretty good job. And I actually felt that Benny Safdie was overacting, like, uh, like Downey Jr. I was like, wow, they're both chewing up a lot of scenery here. Uh, and as usual, Nolan cannot write female characters. He just cannot. And I don't understand why his producer, who's his wife, doesn't say, sweetie, I think you need to hire a female screenwriter to come in here and help you out with these female characters because it's just getting ridiculous at this point. There's been a lot of talk about a love scene, uh, but really it's just Florence Pugh unnecessarily topless for like most of her scenes. And she doesn't have very many scenes. Uh, and I've never seen Emily Blunt so dour, but I guess such a, I guess such a delightful actress being able to portray such a truly horrible woman is something of a victory. I mean, I didn't enjoy the performance because she, again, she was so horrible, but I, I mean, I guess I should be impressed that Emily Blunt was able to pull it off. I was like, wow. Matt Damon does a nice job as the only stand-up person who's also realistic as to how the world actually works in the entire film. Uh, my IMAX uh, showing, by the way, switched between not just color and black and white cinematography, which all showings will do, but for the IMAX showing, this thing was switching aspect ratio constantly as well, and it was distracting, and it seemed always for no apparent reason. Now, I know that Nolan and the rest of the cast have said, oh no, when it's black and white, it's a different perspective. That's first perspective or something, and the other one is subjective, and one's objective, and I was like, this is not coming across. You're just flipping around the, the aspect ratio and the colors, you know, from black and white to color constantly with no, it's seemingly no rhyme or reason. I guess it would become more apparent with a second or third viewing, but I can't imagine anybody sitting through this more than once who isn't a diehard Nolan fan. So should you even see Oppenheimer? What would be my suggestion? Well, if you're a cinephile, of course you should see it. You can't miss the new Christopher Nolan movie. He is a major filmmaker and you should see his work for yourself. Now, if you're not a big cinephile or you're trying to be fiscally responsible with your movie ticket money, more power to you, consider a subscription service like A-List or something. But if that's your situation, you could certainly wait to see this on digital. It does not need a big screen. And with a three-hour runtime, it's probably better to watch at home on your own time. Uh, but I would check it out at some point, even if you wait to watch it on Universal's Peacock. Remember, Nolan switched to Universal. It depicts an important historical event. Just don't take it at face value. I would look at this as more of a starting point in looking into the atomic age, because Nolan certainly doesn't paint a full picture. And I suspect from my cursory research after watching the film, he got some of it wrong. And the, the film, though, is very nicely shot. You know, everybody, especially if you like movies, you appreciate a well-made film. It looks great, it has gorgeous cinematography, and it does have an excellent score. As you would expect from Nolan and his collaborators here, Hoyt Van Hoytema is the cinematographer, and good old Ludwig Gordonson doing the score. Plus, as I said, Murphy is quite good. Robert Downey Jr. is always fun to see, even when he's chewing scenery. And there is a cavalcade of familiar faces. So I guess, you know, even though that kind of takes you out of the movie a little bit, at least it will keep you engaged if you're not enjoying it. But I will say, when the movie was finally over, I was relieved. And my press screening, I would say, it was not an overwhelming applause when the movie was over. And I would say at least half of the audience did not applaud. I didn't applaud because I didn't like the movie. 
So that's my review of Oppenheimer. Believe me, I am deeply disappointed, and I would be thrilled if you ended up having a better experience. But I'm just telling you, approach with caution, because you might have my experience or somewhere in between. All right, so share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today, and of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.